Today's guest on Crystal Storytellers Podcast is former military fighter and test pilot, engineer, retired astronaut, former commander of the International Space Station, and retired U.S. Navy captain, Scott Kelly. What I really wrote a book about was this kid that was a struggling student found inspiration from a book and then later, you know, flew in space four times. So that's really, I think, what struck a chord with a lot of people. You know, I, I read your book. It's inspired me. My, my kid read your book 10 times and now, you know, they're motivated. I hope they uh, move on to another book because they should probably read something else now. <laughs> Get ready to set sail with Scott Kelly as he shares fascinating personal stories with Crystal Symphony's cruise director as they sail from Tokyo to San Francisco. For thousands of years, mankind has gazed into the skies with wonder and curiosity, yet only a select few have experienced the privilege of gazing back at planet Earth through thousands of miles in space. There's a song that says, I see the world without any borders, without any fighting, without any fear. And I thank our guest today, former astronaut, military fighter pilot, test pilot, engineer, and retired U.S. Navy Captain Scott Kelly might be able to relate to those words. Hi, I'm Russ Thomas Grieve, the cruise director aboard the Crystal Symphony, and I thank you for joining us here today. My guest is a veteran of four space flights, having commanded the International Space Station for three expeditions, and a member of the year-long mission also to the International Space Station. He is the author of the book Endurance, a remarkable first-hand account of the record-setting sojourn, the single longest space mission by an American astronaut. I'm very excited to be sitting here with you, Scott, especially after listening to you speak about your career as an aviator and an astronaut. Not only as a career professional, but your remarkable ability to articulate the beauty and lore associated with space exploration. Well, welcome to the Crystal Storytellers podcast, Scott, and uh, it's nice to have you here. Great to be here, Russ. Good. I got to tell you, to start things off, as a kid, I think at my age, everybody wanted to be an astronaut as a kid. And uh, you saw the launch from the pad, and it was breathtaking. And everybody wanted to experience that. Well, you have experienced that. So just tell us about your path to aviation and eventually space exploration, first as an EMT and then working in the Navy. Well, I wasn't one of these uh, typical guys or girls that become an astronaut that, you know, saw... Uh, something on TV or saw a launch and had uh, and that made uh, a big impression or at least a big enough impression on them to where they were really motivated for the rest of their you know educational career that had they had the single-minded goal of flying in space I was interested in it but I never actually thought I could be part of the space program just because I was not a good student um, I don't know if it's because I had you know, ADD or ADHD, never diagnosed, but I just did not do well in school. So it was something that was, you know, I felt like it was part of my life growing up in the 1960s and 70s, something I was interested in, but it was sort it was kind of like I was interested in it like I was interested in dinosaurs, you know, and I'm not going to be a dinosaur, I'm not going to be an astronaut. It's cool, but never going to happen for me. But it wasn't until I was, you know, older, I was in college, I was still a struggling student, uh, not doing well, and I just happened to stumble across the book, The Right Stuff, by Tom mm -hmm. Wolfe. I read the book, I was inspired, and uh, that book kind of became, uh, you know, my spark. It had a plan in there on how someone goes from, you know, college student, in some cases, you know, they kind of followed the Tom wrote about these guys when they were a little bit younger mm -hmm. in their military careers and how they later became test pilots and and astronauts and I felt like I re could relate to them uh, in a lot of ways with uh, one way I did not relate and that is I didn't know how to study or pay attention or do my homework and I just thought if I could just focus on that one thing and fix that one thing maybe someday I could you know be a military pilot a, a, a test pilot maybe quite possibly even an astronaut and it, you know changed my life. We'll talk about your brother here in just a little yeah. bit, but did you inspire him, or did he inspire you, or how did that all come about? You know, uh, when we were uh, going into high school, all of a sudden, in the ninth grade, he started getting straight A's, mm -hmm. and I didn't. I still struggled. Uh, always wondering what happened, how did he, he do this, and a few years ago, he told me that when we were, like, the summer of eighth grade, our dad sat the two of us down and explained how or, you know, told us 
you know, you guys aren't really good uh, students, so we're going to start thinking about a vocational education for you, which there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, my brother thought, that's not for me. I, and on the other hand, had no recollection whatsoever of that whole conversation. So I continued along my path of, of struggling. Um, and I don't, you know, maybe there was a squirrel running outside the window or something. <laughs> Why well, I didn't, I didn't get the message. But um, so his his career and path into the Navy was uh, was different than mine. Although we ended up in the same place, so it uh, it's really a lesson of how you can, you know, kind of start off in the same place. The fact that we're identical twins uh, with uh, you know the same opportunity, you can have. Uh, significant deviations, but uh, you know, maybe through hard work, perseverance, never giving up, wind up um, uh, with a similar outcome. Wow! And you started as an EMT. You know, I was. Uh, that was one of the things I was interested in and actually good at when I was a when I was a kid. And like the, I think in the tenth grade, I started uh, volunteering in this emergency rescue squad we had in my hometown of West Orange, New Jersey, and uh, that was the one thing. I could do well at and I could study for, um, which was interesting. And I found that un unusual because I couldn't really focus on anything else. But I think it was just because I was interested in it mm -hmm. and it was important to me. Um, and and I, I think that's a good lesson in the fact that if you find an interest or a spark or something that gets your attention, even a you know, struggling bad student like me can turn into somebody that can perform at a, at a pretty high level. Good for you. Excellent. Uh, you've experienced uh, multiple missions, each of them their own unique objective and final outcomes. Yet, you bring a philosophical and humanitarian perspective to your writing about your missions. Is there a larger mission that drives you as an ambassador of space exploration? You know, now my my job is no longer flying in space, and I don't officially work for NASA, but I feel like having had the the privilege of uh, being an astronaut and uh, working for the U.S. government as an astronaut for NASA, I think I have an obligation to, to share that story and uh, the story of the importance of space flight, um, what we do, how we do it, uh, how it benefits humanity, and also, um, you know, what the experience is like from a personal perspective particularly with regards to, you know, looking at a planet Earth and that uh, perspective uh, it gives you when you uh, look at Earth from space. So you said you grew up in the 60s and 70s. You saw the first man walk on the moon. Mm -hmm. You saw John Glenn, all of the people who were sort mm -hmm. of pioneers in their yeah. day. Um, it's amazing to see how far we have come in space mm -hmm. exploration yeah. over the many years. And there's much more to come, yeah. don't you believe? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've, uh, you know, if you if you consider the fact that we first flew an airplane in uh, in uh, 1903 mm -hmm. was uh, the Wright brothers' flight at uh, Kitty Hawk, mm -hmm. first uh, powered flight, and in 1969, we're uh, we're walking on the moon, uh, 66 years mm -hmm. later. That's an incredible, um, it, it, you know, incredible advancement in technology. Um, if you were to extrapolate that another 50 years, which is where we are today, I would say that we've um, been able to continue to do incredible things, but we haven't gotten as far as the moon since. So, uh, you know, we do have... Uh, an incredible potential, but I still think that at this point we probably should have uh, had boots on Mars by now, <laughs> but we will someday, and uh, I am confident of, of that. I don't know when it will be, but um, I think it will be uh, possible. What I'm more interested in is is in the fact that, you know, if you, if you look at, you know, technological advancement from 1903, let's say to 2003, uh, you know, we had an international space station uh, in orbit by then. Mm -hmm. What it's going to be like a hundred years from now, right? And uh, I don't think anyone even has any idea. Uh, you can't really even imagine it. You might come the closest because you've uh, been to the space station. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as, as to what it might be like. Yeah. Wow. It's a. Uh, but just to go back to what you said earlier uh, about uh, maybe we've not uh, progressed as quickly mm -hmm. as we have. 
do you think maybe the challenger the the episode with the challenger might have set us back a little bit in time you know accidents always uh set you back uh from a, a schedule perspective um you know, certainly we suffer incredible human losses mm -hmm. in, in any accidents. I didn't know the Challenger crew, but I knew all of uh, the crew members on Columbia, um, uh, three of which were my astronaut classmates, wow. and that is, um, you know, it's devastating. But at the same time, it, I think it's also inspirational that, um, you know, you have people that are willing to risk their lives, and, and, and some people actually lose their lives to benefit the, uh, you know, the common good. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it, 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 it does, uh, you know, hold you back from a, from a schedule, schedule perspective, but we always learn things from it. We, um, make, uh, our spacecraft better. We learn to manage, uh, the programs in a more safe and, um, uh, responsible way that, uh, you know, will then benefit us going forward. Hopefully we don't lose those lessons along the way, and I think it's always good to have a little go back, a little reminder of, and that's why, I mean, NASA always, um, you know, we, we never forget uh, the people that we've lost and the, the failures right. to help us in the future. They all created something uh, for us to remember them by. Yeah. Uh, you set a record for the longest duration in space of an American astronaut, of course. There are physical challenges and critical issues to, uh, to contend with on any space mission. Uh, what did you miss the most about being thousands of miles mm. above the Earth? <laughs> well, the space station isn't thousands of miles above the Earth. It goes thousands of miles per hour. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, 250 miles generally above the planet okay. in space, going very, uh, very, very quickly. Um, so even though you are not uh, far away, um, you know, if you just measured it with a ruler, the fact that you're going so fast and the physics behind uh, getting back home is uh, something that you're very, very aware of. So, uh, you know, physically you might not be far away, but you do feel very disconnected, uh, you know, in a, in a certain way. You have good uh, connectivity with the planet, kind of like what this ship has, you know, what a crystal, sure. you have the ability to do email, you can uh, make phone calls, you can have video conferences with home, um, but, um, you uh, you know you're you you're just very conscious of, of, of the fact that, that that from a physics perspective you you're you're very far from being being home and you do miss things I mean this, the stuff I always missed on Earth uh, when I was in space for a long period of time is uh, people um, you know you have people there with you and generally you get along with them and like them but uh, you know they don't it's not a big variety so you miss your your loved ones your friends your family and you miss the weather you know the ability to you know feel the sun on your face the wind on your back uh rain the sound of rain the sound of nature we actually had um i would have, after a while i i asked the ground to send me up some files of like you know just you know the noises of uh you know, a forest or no noises in the jungle or a rainstorm. One day, I, when we first got those up there, I had some pretty new crew members on board, and I played the uh, the rainstorm sound. And one of the American guys, guy Chellinger, and great guy, <laughs> comes like flying out of his crew quarters, thinking we had some like <laughs> massive water leak somewhere. Oh, man, <laughs> yeah. If you're not used to hearing that <laughs> yeah. up there, I'm sure that it would be kind of a, a bit yeah. uh, abrupt to you. Yeah. Um, did you miss driving the car? That's that's something I would think that you might miss, maybe. Mm, yeah, you know, you miss yeah miss earthly things like mm -hmm. uh, you know that. Uh, there's uh, you know even though you're in, having this incredible experience um, and you're in an amazing place with a uh, incredible view, you're doing very meaningful work. Um, Earth has much to offer that. You know, space does not. Mm -hmm. um, not only driving, but uh, yeah, gravity, which um, is fun not having, but makes most things difficult. Uh, you know, Earth, uh, Earth has a lot to offer. And your diet must be a little different up there. I'm sure you don't have, uh, you know, meats and uh, things like that. That you. It... The space diet is uh, um, developed for a few reasons. One is. You don't have significant refrigeration 
you don't have significant ability to um, resupply the spacecraft. So the food you have has to be, um, you know, stabilized in some way from, uh, you know, basically from rotting or, or, right. or so. The different types of food we have are stuff that you rehydrate, um, which is kind of like camping food. People have ever been Packages. camping, like, yeah, the mountain mm -hmm. home. It's not like exactly like that, but it's similar. Um, food that's irradiated, so you'll have meat in, like, packages that are um, similar to, like, the military meals, MREs, meals ready to eat. So the bacteria is killed with radiation. And then you have some of the foods just kind of like off-the-shelf stuff that you could buy in a grocery store, like, you know, a can of chicken or a package of chicken or oh. that kind of stuff. Um, not very much fresh food. When we would get a resupply ship, we would get, um, you know, some fresh fruits and vegetables, but they wouldn't last very long, a few days. But the thing about space food is that if space food was really good, Somebody would have like started a restaurant and just called it space food. <laughs> right? True. <laughs> yes, uh, mm. camping food. When you say yeah. it, it resembles that, I don't think that that would go yeah. too well in a, yeah. in a brick and mortar. Uh, if most people who followed your story, they know you're a twin, mm. and uh, so you and your brother Mark were part of an extensive astronaut twin study conducted mm. by NASA. Yeah, you collected data about yourselves while in space and on Earth, respectively. Having reviewed the summary report on the study, there were some surprising results, particularly around DNA and how the body reacts differently to long-term zero gravity. What did you find to be the most compelling results in the study? Um, well, when I heard like 7% of my uh, genes, which are genes, are not our pants, but our <laughs> DNA, RNA, and protein, how 7% uh, of that had like re-expressed itself or uh, which means they've either like turned on or turned off over the course of my year there, uh, different than my brother who was used as a control subject to compare me to him. Mm -hmm. That was, um, you know, I, I was curious about it. I didn't feel it. Uh, I didn't all of a sudden have something that I could, you know, some change in me that I could attribute to that, but it was... Um, interesting to find out. I was actually, when I found that out, I was in the, the woods in uh, California camping with my oldest daughter, and uh, all of a sudden I'm starting to get all these newspaper articles and like reporters asking me about this, and I'm like, hey, I'm in the woods, so maybe, you know, who knows, maybe I'm like a rhesus monkey right now, <laughs> change, but uh, my telomeres also got better, and those are the ends of our chromosomes that are... Uh, hmm. Uh, uh, an indication of your physical age. So as we age, they get uh, shorter and more frayed. Mine actually got better in space, and then immediately went back to kind of where they were Once you beforehand. So that's mm -hmm. interesting. Um, and we don't really understand, you know, what the mechanism is there, but uh, it's uh, you know a very uh, important, I think, part of that whole study is the genetic research NASA is doing in space, which we had never really done before, and this was. This twin study with my brother and I was an opportunity to, for NASA to kind of get involved in that. How cool. I think it's really great mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, you must have felt special, shall you say. Is it, was it special to do that? <laughs> you know, I, I, I consider myself like a below average guy doing a slightly above average job. So That's how um, you've depicted yourself from the beginning <laughs> of the interview here that you did that uh, as a kid. But uh, I think that uh, yeah, it's pretty, you're pretty special. Uh, many private companies and wealthy entrepreneurs are investing into space travel Yeah, uh, on a private basis. What are your thoughts about the, the future of that? You know, if uh, you know you have people that want to invest their own money in something that you feel uh, very passionate about, I'm all for it. I think it's great. I think it's uh, it's uh, you know in some ways reinvigorated people's interest in in the space program. Having uh, some entrepreneurs and that that are willing to put their own money into spaceflight. I think there's a balance though between government and uh, these uh, you know private or in some cases public companies like Boeing uh, doing this they do that not all of them but uh, you know definitely SpaceX and Boeing they operate in a in a partnership with NASA um, uh, it's not I think a lot of people have this m a misunderstanding that uh, this is completely new for NASA but NASA didn't build the space shuttle 
they managed the program. Mm -hmm. They designed it. Very, very involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, operations of, of building and operating the space shuttle. The new model is different, and by giving a company like SpaceX a uh, you know a set of requirements and saying, hey, we don't care how you meet those as long as it's safe and it, uh, it allows us to meet our mission objectives. The idea is perhaps you can do this uh, cheaper because you know government. I don't know how we got there, but the government is a huge bureaucracy, and it just becomes very expensive. So hopefully by having these kind of partnerships, it allows NASA to then go on and develop technologies and infrastructure and systems that will uh, help us get to Mars sooner. I see Mr. Branson is opening up a space station yeah. in New Mexico. A spaceport. A spaceport, that's yeah. it. And. Uh, Quarter of a million dollars to go up, he said. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I just uh, heard yeah. recently. Yeah. So, uh, who knows? Who knows what the future will bring? Maybe you'll uh, someday have the uh, crystal space. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised because, you know, in our new endeavor, we will have a helicopter and mm -hmm. we also have a submarine. So, I would not be surprised yeah. to see it. <laughs> uh, you've been both to outer space and the vast oceanic depths of 20,000 mm -hmm. feet below the sea. Are there any similarities or did you find any similarities between the two? Oh, I haven't been that deep, okay. but uh, I have been in a U.S. Navy submarine, um, uh, which is very similar to living on the, on the space station. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, the International Space Station is more like a, a ship or a submarine than it is an airplane, uh, just in how it's operated and, and um, you know, the size, the, uh, the way the systems function. Um, so there are similarities in, in, in the operations of, of it, the, uh, certainly with the space station, how, how removed you are from civilization compared to like a, a submarine. So there are definitely, uh, definitely parallels. I actually lived, um, to change the subject just a little bit, I actually did this thing where I lived in, the, in this uh, undersea habitat. Uh, for a couple of, um, I did it twice for, you know, a period of like a week at a time that is in, in the sea floor in Key Largo, mm. off of Key Largo, Florida, in this marine sanctuary, which is an absolutely incredible experience. And there, there's certainly, <clears throat> you know, parallels to that. NASA uses that as a, a, a test bed for uh, astronauts to live and work in a you know, an operationally challenging but also risky environment because when you dive out of a habitat like that, when you've been um, uh, at depth for any length of time, it's, you know, it's pretty serious stuff because you can't mm -hmm. come to the surface. It's saturation diving where if you uh, ascended, you could potentially die of, of the bend. So it gives us a uh, place to operate where, you know, some risk uh, and pa certainly parallels. I think both places, under the sea and in space, <laughs> is a bit of a risk, I will say that. Mm -hmm. All right, you've lived uh, and literally trusted your life to Russians aboard the uh, International Space Station. What do you think the world can learn from these lessons and trust beyond the politics and borders? You know, that's one of the great things about spaceflight, and um, right now the International Space Station is that it's a... Uh, a, a program that is operated um, in a neutral place that is for you know the benefit of mankind or humankind um, and it allows us to work together with people and countries that, that you know at times we may have been enemies with particularly the Russians mm -hmm. um, and you know one of the uh, I think the highlights of the space station program is that it's an international program and uh, uh, even the personal highlights for me is the international aspect of it. I mean, I have, you know, some of my best friends now are Russian cosmonauts. Mm. Um, and uh, it was a real joy uh, spending time in space with them. And sometimes people think, like, you know, are you ever talk politics or any, or any arguments or disagreements? We might talk about it, but, um, you know, some political things, but it's almost like, you're not talking about your own country and, and Russia. You're talking about two, like, third-party countries because what you understand in space is that you are, uh, you know, you're reliant literally on, e on each other for, for our lives. 
So, with that said, English is the, the spoken language in the space station? Yeah, the, the official language of the space station is English. We do, um, we do speak Russian sometimes on the space station, but uh, not that often. On the Russian Soyuz, which we use to get to and from uh, space right now, that's all Russian, uh, mostly technical. The, uh, the cosmonauts, though, they generally speak English better than we speak Russian because of a few reasons. One, they're, uh, a lot of them take it in school growing up. They uh, are exposed to the language culturally uh, with movies and TV shows. And, and you know, neither of those we do in, in the United States or even in Europe, for that matter. Uh, it's an easier language. Uh, to, my understanding is easier to go from Russian to English than the other direction. And then the Russians are motivated to do it because it's useful for international travel. I mean, if you're a complete Russian speaker, you can't, you know, right. it's kind of hard to navigate the world. Um, whereas, you know, we're lucky as English, native English speakers that for the most part you can, you can get around. It's kind of like an airline pilot as well. I think English is the official yeah. language for all airlines. No yeah. And, right. and uh, for um, it's the international language of mariners as well. Absolutely. Um, all right. Something that's near and dear to you is your book. Yes. yes. Uh, your book, Endurance. You talk a lot about the unknown and the risks of space travel, but a great deal of those risks are calculated and science-based. How do you manage the balance between science and taking the leap of the heart? Um, you know, you... You know, you. I, I think whenever any people do anything risky, whether it's jumping out of an airplane or scuba diving, you know, they look at it and they are, they're like, "Hey, I want to do this. Uh, here's w how I benefit from it. Whether it's just because it's fun, or you know, because it's my job, or, and because I believe in uh, what I'm doing. I understand the risk, and um, you know, I understand sometimes that despite understanding the risk, just you know, bad things happen and you can just be unlucky. Uh, space flight is risky. Uh, the space shuttle program had uh, basically a 1 in 70 chance of, of getting killed, uh, which would be like if you took a bunch of cards and just threw them into a group of people, whoever got the ace of spades, you know, never uh, went home again. Um, but you, you know, you weigh the, the risk, uh, versus how important you think what you're doing. Um, and then you uh, hope for the best. <laughs> so with that said, when you feel the rumble and you're in that seat and you're ready to go up, I mean, your heart's got to race a little bit. Yeah, it does. I mean, uh, we don't have uh, any heart monitors on the space shuttle when uh -huh. I was flying the space shuttle anymore, but you do on the, on the Soyuz. I think my the Russian Soyuz, even though I was very relaxed... Um, on my last flight launching on the Soyuz uh, because it was my uh, fourth launch into space and my uh, second launch on the Russian Soyuz uh, I think my heart rate still got about up to about 120 just sitting there in a, in a seat. That's normal, isn't it? 120? <laughs> well, oh, you mean your pulse? My, I was thinking yeah, my heart blood rate. pressure. No, no, my heart rate. <laughs> okay, your heart yeah. rate. I was thinking of blood pressure. <laughs> like... <laughs> Maybe, maybe 120 is normal for you. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah, I'm confused there. Yeah, yeah. All right, sorry yeah, about that. No problem. Uh, all right, uh, the book is about your record-setting mission, but you really cover the broader topic of personal endurance yeah. and personal conviction and how we can achieve in a larger context. So did you have that theme in mind when you started writing the book, or did the broader message just evolve over time? You know, I think uh, when you're when you're writing a, a story and it's your life story, you learn things about yourself in in retrospect. You know, like as an example, I didn't I didn't even realize um, until I was writing my book that I read the book The Right Stuff mm. at 18 years old, and then almost to the day of when I read it. Uh, 18 years later, I'm flying in space for the first time. Never even dawned on me during the whole my whole life that. But it wasn't until I was putting words to paper that you realize some of these things. Um, you know, and I think there are, there are other things like that in the in the book that I that I wrote that I realized. You know, I thought in the beginning I was basically writing a book about spending a year on the space station. But what I really wrote a book about was 
this kid that was a struggling student found inspiration from a book and then later, you know, flew in space four times. And that's really, I think, what struck a chord with a lot of people. You know, I, I read your book. It's inspired me. My, my kids read your book, and now, you know, they're motivated. Uh, my kid read your book ten times. I hope they uh, move on to another book because they should probably read something else now. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you've inspired a lot of people. Yeah, yeah I hope so. Yeah. That's great. That's How long did it take uh, from pen to paper? Um, <clears throat> it was about a year and a half. About a year and a half? Yeah. And Margaret, uh, my uh, collaborator on my book, mm -hmm. Margaret Lazarus Dean, is on the, this Crystal she Symphony. She is with us. Uh, with us. You are so yeah. right. Looking forward to yeah. hear, uh, hearing her do her thing here mm -hmm. in a day or so. A yeah. uh, couple of things real quickly, and uh, the one thing that uh, I wanted to ask you is, as a kid, as I said, I wanted to be an astronaut. I think that's why I'm so enamored sitting here with you, because I never thought that I would have this experience. And um, the thing that really kept me from wanting to be an astronaut as a kid was a thing called the Vomit Comet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I kind of wanted to know what yeah. your experience was in that, because it's that thing that spins around and around uh, that you see on television. Yeah. Well, there's a centrifuge, uh, uh -huh. and, and that, that spins around. That gives you positive G. Right. The, uh, the NASA Vomit Comet is an airplane that does these ah. parabolic uh, trajectories that allows you to float in the back for, you know, 25 seconds or so. People, a lot of people get sick in that, hence, hence the name. But um, there doesn't seem to be a correlation between, like, that experience and whether people actually get sick in space, oh. uh, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I've been in that airplane with people that have been, like, throwing their guts up, <laughs> uh, and they do fine in space. And other people do very poor. They do fine in the airplane, and then they do, don't do well in space. So it's kind of person dependent i'm sure you'd be fine you live on a ship <laughs> the ship moves a little bit so you I don't do know. you do just fine uh the teacups at disney sometimes <laughs> get to me so i don't know <laughs> i don't i don't like roller coasters not sure. because they make me nauseous but i don't like how they bounce my head around that's true yeah. that's true all right just real quickly we're going to do a couple quick fire questions uh mm -hmm. current favorite book current other than your own <laughs> you know, my favorite book is always like the last book I I read. That's I guess. A great right? answer. Yeah, I can't beat that. Um, yeah. So the I, the last book I read was this book uh, called uh, "Doing Justice" by Preet Bharara, who was a former um, U.S. attorney in the uh, Southern District of New York. I, it's a great book. It's not a it's not a political book. Some people I think might think it's political, but it's really uh, really a good explanation of the. Uh, criminal justice system in the United States, and I think it's a, a, a book that, uh, you know, everyone should read. Excellent. Along with endurance. Yeah. Strangest food you've ever eaten? Um, I had jellyfish a couple of days ago in uh, Hong Kong. That was a little strange. Chewy? I, you know, I, I like the taste. The uh, consistency was a little hard to get past. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Beatles or Rolling Stones? Beatles. I was watching the Beatles... Uh, the uh, Ron Howard documentary last night on on this ship. Ah, yeah. good. Yeah, very good. Ron Howard does everything good. I mm -hmm. gotta say, Star Wars or Star Trek. Mm. You know, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I think uh, you know. I used to say Star Wars because I thought the lightsaber was cool, but mm -hmm. I think I think my opinion has kind of evolved over time, and I like more the uh, Star Trek mission of you know boldly go where no one's gone before and not mess with the people there you know <laughs> leave no trace <laughs> can you do the sign though with the uh, the v do... i think i can yeah, yeah you got it Pretty you got good. it down yeah. excellent today or tomorrow i have never been asked that question wow so today or tomorrow so do you live for today or mm -hmm. I'm kind of, i think i'm more of a today person in the moment yeah i think so i get it I, I don't know if that's the right answer, um, but I think that's me. I don't think there is a right answer. I'm going to ask my wife what she <laughs> thinks when we get done. Okay. Uh, thank you, mm -hmm. Captain Scott Kelly, for being here today. Mm -hmm. uh, i got to say, I think we're all better for having taken the journey with you yeah. today. Uh, it's It's been very enlightening. Uh, thanks for sharing your experiences and, uh, you know, everything that you've learned with us uh, here. It's it's, it's great. Um Endurance is the name of the book. It's available online. It's available in one of your fabulous bookstores uh, yeah. wherever you live. And uh, 
We'll look forward to seeing you maybe back here on the Crystal Cruise again real, real soon. Okay? I would I would absolutely love to. This has been a great experience. This is my third Crystal Cruise, and uh, I look forward to doing some more. It won't be your last. So thank you for joining us here at home. Until next time, eat, drink, be happy. I'm Russ Thomas Grieve, Crystal Symphony. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Crystal Storytellers. If you haven't already, please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. For more information about upcoming Crystal sailings, please visit www.crystalcruises.com. See you next week when we are joined by journalist, author, and historian Ken Walsh.